you know, as a youth growing up, the especially in the church, you know, the world can seem life itself actually can seem very complicated, very complex. But you know, as I grow older, uh, as we start a family, um, which also mimics you know, the family of God and the relationship that God and Jesus Christ has with the church, uh, we start to realize that life at its most fundamental level is really just about relationships. The Ten Commandments are the foundation of these said relationships. And the first four, um, the first four indicate a relationship with God and man, mankind. The last six indicate the relationship that we are able to have with each other. <coughs> you know, God does want to have a relationship with, with mankind, with humans. Let's go to a few kind of foundational scriptures here for the message. If you can turn with me to Exodus 19. We'll read verse 5 and 6 of Exodus 19. Now therefore, you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We've heard that term before. It will come up again. You know, and then furthermore, you know, God is speaking with Israel here. Israel was to be a model nation. It was his, it was his children. And, and God was to give Israel the blessings beyond all other nations if they just obeyed him. Of course, it wasn't in their heart to do it. Let's read in 1 Peter 2, this promise expanded not just to physical Israel, but also to spiritual Israel as well. Peter, 1 Peter 2, and then verse 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. His own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. So God wants to have a relationship with, with humans. He is building a family. And he also wants us to have a relationship with each other as well. Let's turn to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, and we'll read verses 2 and 3. Uh, we'll start with verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond and peace. That's what we are called to be. I like the way that the, the NIV translates this. It says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. And then one last kind of introductory scripture, Romans 12. Romans 12 and verse 18. <coughs> If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. However, we haven't done too well with these two great commands, the relationship with God and the relationship with each other. No, since the time of Cain and Abel, we still have not figured out how to live peaceably with one another. And since pre-flood and Tower of Babel, Man has tried to live without God. You know, before the kingdom comes, the world will have to go through uh, much tribulation. The physical creation will need to be restored. And we know that God will produce a new heaven and a new earth. However, one that I think gets overlooked at times is the restoration that relationships will also require. Relationships between God and, and our relationship with each other. So these relationships will need to be mended, and this will be a formidable task. So I'd like to turn to the scripture that we're going to analyze today, 
Revelation 22, uh, which pictures this time of restoration. Revelation 22, and we'll read verses 1 and 2. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life. Remember, the tree of life was cut off from mankind after Adam and Eve had left the Garden of Eden. Once again, it will be opened up to it will be opened up to all. So it was the tree of life which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for healing of the nations. So, brethren, my purpose today, while this describes perhaps a literal tree, the language that's used here suggests a figurative or symbolic meaning of healing and of service, as I will show. These two aspects were focal points of Jesus Christ's ministry, and he embodied them and he fulfilled them on a small scale in a small region of the earth while he was alive. But they may also be indicative of our future roles and responsibility in the kingdom of God. So if you're taking notes and, and uh, you'd like to um, have a title for this message, I've titled this, this quote sermon here, Service, Healing, and the Leaves of the Tree of Life. Service, Healing, and the Leaves of the Tree of Life. And so the word that I want to analyze here is the word healing. Healing of the nations. The Greek uh, that is used, that this word is translated from, is the word therapia, and Strong's G2322. Um, therapy is derived from this word, uh, according to the online etymology dictionary. And from Thayer's Greek lexicon, there's two definitions for this word. The first one that's mentioned is service rendered by one to another. That was a little, a little surprising to me. The second definition uh, is a little more natural. It's special medical service, curing, or healing. Now, I think this is significant because John could have used at least three other words if he just wanted to describe a, a special medical healing, a supernatural or miraculous type of healing, which we know uh, will happen, what will occur in the kingdom of God. So therefore, we can separate this concept into two parts, healing and service. And so as we will see, Jesus Christ embodied therapy. So let's analyze each of these aspects um, to understand how they might apply to our role in the future kingdom of God. So the first one is healing. The first significant event that Luke records after Jesus resists Satan for 40 days. Um, he goes to a synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom in Nazareth, and he reads a prophecy about himself from Isaiah 61. So let's read about this account here in Luke 4, if you turn with me. Luke 4. In verse 16, we'll read 16 to 21. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read, and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. So healing was a fundamental aspect of Jesus Christ's ministry. John, John said that he had performed so many miracles that if they had tried to record them, the world would not be big enough to capture all of the miraculous things that he did. But in the Gospels, um, 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John record 37 miracles that Jesus Christ performed. 28 of those were miraculous healings. So that's a majority, that's 75%. Now, this is interesting to me. Um, I have a background in bioengineering, uh, and I work in the medical device industry. So technology now can do some pretty amazing things. Things like um, artificial limbs that can connect to synapses in the brain and actually move when people think. Um, uh, glucose, uh, glucose monitor that fits in a contact lens. Uh, artificial hearts and organs that are grown in the lab, used from uh, grown from patients' own cells. Really, really tremendous um, advances in technology. But these all pale in comparison to the types of healings, uh, miraculous healings, and, and uh, physical infirmities that will be healed in the kingdom. We know that the blind shall see, the deaf shall hear, the, the lame shall leap. But more significantly, God will provide, and we will partake in spiritual and emotional healing. And there's a, a, a correlation and aspect to all of these that Jesus Christ mentions here, uh, from, from a physical to a spiritual side. So let's look at each of these in a little more detail. To preach the gospel to the poor. You know, according to um, well, according to Jesus, he said, "You know, the poor will always be with you. We'll always have the poor." Uh, and, to, and, and, and today's well, actually, uh, in 2013, it was the last time that the World Bank, uh, WorldBank.org, had data to uh, comprise some statistics, and they stated that 11 percent of the world lives on less than two dollars a day. That's 700 and, 760 million people. You know, God cares about the poor. He knew that any government that man could create or invent would be an imperfect one. And while God does not want us to be impoverished, impoverished uh, riches should not be our priority. See, there's nothing intrinsically virtuous about being poor, but a particular kind of distraction comes from uh, acquiring wealth or desiring to acquire wealth. And that's the distraction of self-sufficiency or self-aggrandizement. Let's turn to 1 Timothy 6. First Timothy 6, and we'll read verses 17 through 19. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. So God chooses the poor because they're, they're humble. They are humble to the point where we rely on Him. Right? And, and at that time, we are convinced that good gifts and blessings are from His hand and from His strength and not by our own might. So we're commanded to seek first the kingdom of God, to lay up treasure in heaven, and know that we are sustained by God's strength. And to God be the glory. The brokenhearted. Have you dedicated your life to something that you thought was true only to find out that it was uh, rejected or false? For example, imagine people who are completely bought, completely sold, all in on a certain ideology. You know, in today's climate, uh, a few come to mind. The Islamic fundamentalist, the seventh century Muslim who murders in the name of Allah. Religious martyrs were promised virgins of paradise. And they believe them. They act on those beliefs. On the other end of the spectrum, the militant atheist who attacks God, who calls the Bible a fictional fairy tale for lesser minds when science wasn't around to explain the world. Or Christians who perhaps believe they'll go to heaven. Right? 
entire lives dedicated in faith to false gospels, how will they feel when they are raised, when they come up in the kingdom, and they realize it's all false? The word brokenhearted can be translated broken to shivers, they'll be broken to pieces. They'll have to be put together, they'll have to be taught. Psalms 147. Psalms 147 and verse 3. He, God, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. See, when people learn of the Word of God, it gives them comfort. We'll have to show them that God's love is there to make them whole again. The captives. You know, everybody struggles with, with different sins. We often judge others. Because in our eyes, we kind of put a ranking on them. Well, that sin's worse than mine. Mine I can justify. But that one, that one's a little too much. But remember, uh, if we fail in one, in one point we fail, we fail in all. We may struggle with sins our entire life. We're held captive by our carnal nature. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 6. First Corinthians 6, and we'll read verses 8 to 11. Know you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor Violers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, and you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and the Spirit of our God. See, we look at this list and we call these sins because we've been we've been taught. We, our minds have been opened and we understand there's a narrow path and there's a broad path. But the world looks at these, and they don't know the rules. They haven't been caught. They haven't been given understanding. So they look at these, and they say, well, this is who I am. They are prisoners to their own carnal nature. They're captives. We'll have to free them. John 8. John 8, we'll read verses 31 to 36. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, and you are my disciples indeed, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants that have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a, is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but the Son abides, in, abides forever. Therefore, if the Son of Man makes you free, you shall be free indeed. See, without Satan's influence, they will be set free. The temptation will be gone. And the struggle that they've been through, you know, that race of endurance that we're going through now, um, and how we're learning to overcome. That life experience can be used to help others in the kingdom once that influence is gone and they can be taught from scratch, from the most basic level. The blind. <coughs> Please turn to 2 Corinthians 4. Second Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishable, whose minds the God of this age has enlightened, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. 
know, those people who will be broken hearted. Satan has veiled the gospel from them. They have not been called this time. We know that Satan deceives the whole world. We heard yesterday God's plan uh, happens in harvests. We know that their harvest is not yet. It's not yet to come. Have you noticed how worlds, the world society seem to be in a free fall in every meaningful way? Despite how our, our leaders are saying that we make progress, the problem is we're trying to apply we're trying to apply physical answers to spiritual problems. See so the leaders of the world government, the so-called elites, they are blind to our greatest issues. And the oppressed. You know, for many who have grown up like me in the, in the blessed nation and in the United States, in Ireland as well, uh, we take we take our freedom for granted. We take the liberties that we have uh, for granted. But there are countries, there are people that are still very oppressed today. You know, modern slavery today affects 30 million people worldwide. Things like debt bondage, forced marriage, child and forced labor, and human trafficking. You know, for many people, the first time they will taste freedom is when they are resurrected. How long will it take before they can trust people again? Psalm 146. Psalm 146, we'll start in verse 3. But do not put your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, but he returns to his earth. In that very day his plans perish. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, who, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who make heaven and earth, sea and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and the widow. But the way of the wicked, he turns upside down. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, Hosiah, to all generations. Praise the Lord. You know, many of us are struggling with some of these very issues. We all have a predisposition to maybe one, one or another, and we all wrestle to put away our old man. See, we're learning now how to overcome. See, we have hope of God's mercy and salvation in the kingdom. But other people, those who are not being called now, they will be in dire need of human life. So how can people heal after a life resulting from carnal wisdom. Well, God has a plan. We heard about that already in some of our previous messages. One of the first steps will be to educate people on God's Word. Let's turn to Proverbs 4. Proverbs 4, verse 13. Proverbs 4, we'll read verses 20 and 22, 20 through 22. My son, give attention to my words, incline your ear to my sayings, do not let them depart from your eyes, keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them, and health to all their flesh. See, they, they heal, God's word heals the entire body, mind and spirit. See, we also have hope in our elder brother, Christ Jesus, who, like us, lived a physical life and in all points were tempted and finished his race flawlessly without sin. And so he serves as our intercessor. Likewise, as we are learning to overcome in this life, we can serve as an example to people in the millennium and beyond. If we overcome, right, we will be in a better position to help, to heal, 
to allow people to learn God's way of life, to overcome their own carnal nature. So wrapping up this first aspect, healing. See, one main aspect of Jesus' ministry was the physical and the spiritual healings that he provided. So after God's government is established on earth, we will need to assist in the healing of the nations, of everyone who has ever lived, from the people who have never heard of Jesus Christ who live on an island somewhere secluded, to those who observe some form of false religion, or even an atheist who wages the personal war on God. See, anyone, as we heard, anyone can be a child of God. See, in healing, we will establish trust. We will help rebuild those relationships that have been broken by man's rule, and with the goal that they will be made whole by God's love and mercy. So let's change gears a little bit. So we have heard that we will be kings and priests to rule with Christ in a new government. But if we look back at human history, 5,000 years of recorded history, we've tried many different forms of government. And there's two things that are common with all of them. One, they were all created, established, and run by humans. And two, they all have, or they all will fail. The Sir John Bagot Gulag, a highly honored British general and historian, better known as Glove Pasha, wrote a book called The Fate of Empires and the Search for Survival. In this book, he outlines that all empires, all nations, go through a seven-step, seven-stage cycle in their, uh, in, in their existence. The first stage, the age of pioneers, or the age of conquest. The second, the age of conquest. The third stage, the age of commerce. The fourth, of affluence. The fifth, intellect. The sixth, decadence. And the seventh and final stage, decline and collapse. You know, looking at my home country, the USA, it's easy to tell which stage it's in. I believe it's in the seventh stage, decline and collapse. So if we will be kings and priests, if we will be ruling with God, what will be different? To answer this question, I want to talk about a story, the story of Rehoboam. Rehoboam was Solomon's son, one of his sons. Actually, it's almost here. I found it. Uh, due to Solomon's idolatry, as a result of his affinity for foreign women, prophet Ahijah told Jeroboam, uh, who was one of Solomon's high-ranked officials, that God would strip the majority of the kingdom out of Solomon's hand and out of Rehoboam's hand. It would not pass to Rehoboam. But he wouldn't strip all of them, all of the tribes, just the majority of them, for the sake of David, man after God's own heart. So naturally, Solomon was unhappy at this when he heard, and therefore he attempted to kill Jeroboam, who fled to Egypt. And after some time passed, and after Solomon died, Jeroboam, his official, returned to deliver wise counsel to Rehoboam. So let's pick up the story in 1 Kings chapter 12. First Kings chapter 12. No. We'll pick up the story here in verse 2. So it happened when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard, heard it. He heard the death of Solomon. He was still in Egypt, for he had fled from the presence of King Solomon and had been dwelling in Egypt. That they sent and called him. Then Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam. Came to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, 
Now therefore, lighten up the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke, which he puts on us, and we will serve you. So he said, so he said to them, depart for three days, then come back to me. And people departed for three days. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who stood before his father Solomon while he still there, and he said, How do you advise me to answer these people? Then they spoke to him, saying, If you will be a servant to these people today, and serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, they will be your servants forever. See, the wise counsel told Rehoboam, the heir to the throne, that if he wanted Israel to follow him, he needed to humble himself. He needed to be their servant. A servant leader. Loneliness, humble, caring, compassionate, an empathetic steward. It's quite different from the type of leaders, type of rulership that we see today. That's the difference. So how do you think this young up-and-coming ruler took this advice, handed the keys to the kingdom. I think, I think I read he was about 40 at about, about this time, which is still fairly young. Verse 8, but he rejected the advice that the elders had given him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and stood before him. And he said to them, What advice do you give? How should we answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Lighten the yoke which your father put on us? Then the young men who had grown up with him spoke to him, saying, Thus you should speak to this people who have spoken to you, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you make a light on us. Thus you shall say to them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist, and I will add to your yoke, My father chastised you with whips. I will chastise you with scourges. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day, as the king had directed, saying, Come back to me on the third day. And the king answered the people roughly, and rejected the advice which the elders had given him. And he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, My father made you go heavy, but I will add to your own. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. See, after rejecting the advice of the elders, Rehoboam heeded his young advisors, which resulted in the split of the nation into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. As such, God had fulfilled his word to Jeroboam, who became king of the northern kingdom of Israel. See, but we see this attitude permeate through leadership, different cultures, different times. It's the desire for power and control. We, saw, we see this in, in Jesus' day as well. Mark 10. Mark 10, verse 35. We'll read a few passages here. Mark 10, 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant us that we may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said to him, We are, for we are able. So Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink the cup that I drink, and, and with the baptism that I am baptized with. And the baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. It is for those for whom it is prepared. And when, they, and when the ten had heard the other ten disciples, they began to, great, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. And in verse 42, But Jesus called them and said to himself, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. 
The word that's used here to rule over them or lord it over them it means to be chief, to be leader, to be ruler. So this is how man uses authority. This Greek word here that's used in, in verse 42 is also used in one, one other place in the New Testament in Romans 15. Say, let's turn to Romans 15 to save your place here in Mark 10. We'll come back. See, Romans 15 has a, the same word, but it's used different, differently. It shows a duality. Romans 15 and verse 12. And again, Isaiah says, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him the Gentiles shall hope. See, the word here is translated reign. It's used differently. And it's talking about how Jesus will be raised from the lineage of Jesse and of David. So he uses godly authority, and he rules with godly leadership. And that's the contrast. That's the difference. Worldly rulership versus godly leadership. The latter produces hope. See, history teaches us that mankind has chosen to rule with force rather than love. Selfishness, pride, greed, lust for power, all of those things inhibit us to rule over ourselves adequately. God has allowed us to try for 6,000 years. So what is true leadership? Let's go back to Mark 10. And Jesus tells us in verse 43. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. See, Jesus describes that true leadership as service. It is written that we will be kings and priests. We will reign with Christ for a thousand years. However, the difference will be we will rule with godly authority. We will not be flawed, human authority. And we look to Jesus in that example, that attitude that we are to adopt. So Jesus came in the form of a servant. And we see another example of how he shows how to rule. Let's turn to Matthew 2. So the question is, okay, if you are a servant, then how are you supposed to lead? Matthew 2. Verses 4 to 6. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where Christ was to be born. And so they said to him in Bethlehem, Judea. For thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. The word here that's used, uh, that's translated from rule, means to shepherd. It means to feed, you know, to tend the flock, to keep sheep. And what's the role of a shepherd? We read this verse yesterday, I believe, or two days ago, about the rod and the staff. Psalms 23. We'll turn back over there. Psalms 23. Psalm 23 and verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, for your rod and your staff, they comfort me. See, from the American point of view, culture is more or less violence. We're born out of violence. Our entertainment is violent. So when we see a rod and a staff, we think, oh, it's a weapon. But in the hands of a shepherd, it's a tool. It's comforting to the flock. The shepherd uses the rod to rescue sheep from dangerous places, to bring them back when they've shot them, and to defend the flock from threats. See, as the, the Holy Spirit, as God's power does for us today, 
We will serve. We will teach. We will guide those in the kingdom how to use God's spirit, how to internalize it and produce godly fruit. We will teach them how to allow the we will teach them how to allow God to rule in our in our hearts. To help them with their own decision making. See, so as a parent, we don't always want to have to decide our child. We will. But we'd much rather that they just do good on their own. And that's what God wants for us. He wants us to be our own umpire. He wants God's spirit to help to direct us. So that we choose life. We do what's right. See, that takes character. So part of godly leadership is going to be teaching people how to allow God's spirit to work with our minds. So today as first fruits, as a model nation, we are practicing building this godly character. Tomorrow as kings and priests, we will teach, we will coach, we will instruct people how to live a happy and fulfilled life as God intended. So brethren, how will we rule? We will serve. Jesus was the model of servant leadership. With him, we will humbly reign as shepherds to provide comfort and teach others how to allow, allow God's Spirit to rule on their hearts. Final scripture, Ezekiel 47. See, Ezekiel was shown a vision of the millennial temple complex and a similar or parallel description of the tree of life to the one that we read previously. Ezekiel 47. Verse 12. Along the bank of the river and on this side and that will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not wither, and their fruit will not fail. They will, they will bear fruit every month, because their water flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food, and their leaves for medicine. I'd like to quote from the UCG Bible commentary on this, on this verse here. I think it sums it up quite nicely. Besides the literal application, there is a wonderfully symbolic picture in all this. In the fruitful medicinal trees, we may see God's Spirit working in and through the lives of His righteous servants. For not only are the righteous to partake of the tree of life, they are in a sense to be trees of life themselves. Nourished by the stream of the Holy Spirit, they are to produce goodly, godly fruit and be a life-giving blessing to others. A godly person who continually meditates on and lives according to God's law is like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its, in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. So brethren, my purpose today was to show that this tree of life Revelation 22, symbolic of healing and of service. Two aspects of Christ's ministry that will be expanded on the grandest scale. And it's also indicative of our roles and responsibilities in the kingdom of God on earth. 2,000 years ago, Jesus walked the earth as a servant who performed many miraculous healings as an ambassador for the kingdom of God. He embodied this concept of therapy. He provided the example for the type of rulers or servant leaders that we will be in the kingdom of God. In our roles of service, we will help heal those who have been emotionally and spiritually afflicted, afflicted in this life. The poor, the brokenhearted, the captives, the blind, and the oppressed. So we will need to teach all of these people, God's desire to have a relationship with them and to restore the relationships of the nations. So let us keep this in mind as, as we face trials today. That God strengthens us to overcome, we may use this experience to help those in the future. And let's look forward to the future fulfillment of Christ's mission 
as we serve and we heal all who have ever lived. Amen.